Hello, good morning. So here we are yet again for another lovely session of CENG 4412 Steel and Concrete Design. Uh, in the last uh, video, we, we uh, finished up with tension members, looking at the uh, various factors of tension member analysis. Um, and I also post something related to tension member design. Uh, now, uh, today we're going to move on to a new topic, the next major topic of the course, and that is concrete beam design. So, uh, I wish to, f uh, for the objectives for uh, our lecture today, I wish to do a few things. Um, first, I wish to describe the advantages and disadvantages of concrete as a material, describe the uh, mechanical properties of concrete as a material, explain, explain and develop the concept of the Whitney stress block, uh, apl and apply these concepts to the design and analysis of reinforced concrete beams. Okay, so let's start about, let's look at concrete from the beginning. Uh, concrete from the beginning. Uh, from the beginning. So I want to look at it at a very basic level as a material. So uh, first of all, let's look at why concrete. Why would we use concrete? What are its advantages, etc. So um, those of you who have me for or have had me for our materials class, our civil engineering materials class 3434, uh, this will be a bit of a repeat, but uh, those of you who haven't, well, we'll see. So why concrete? What are the advantages of concrete? Well, who can give me a good advantage of concrete? What's, what are, what's, the, what's the biggest advantage of concrete? It's cheap. it's cheap. Yes, exactly. It's cheap. It's cheap. That's the main advantage of concrete. Yes, it, it is strong in compression, but not in tension. Uh, but steel, of course, is actually stronger in both tension and compression. At, uh, uh, more, it is stronger in both compression and tension compared to concrete, but uh, per, uh, at least per cross-sectional area, per unit weight, et cetera. But uh, the big thing concrete has going for it is economy. So um, basically, this allows, uh, um, it allows, um, let's say, cheaper costs. Um, it is a cheap material. Uh, you can use local material. Not every small town or small city has a, you know, most cities don't have a, a steel foundry in them or a, a steel mill in them, but um, many, uh, but almost every uh, town or city of even modest size has a aggregate mill, a, con a concrete batching plant, etc. And it can also allow for a uh, faster start time. You can often uh, start the manufacture or the, or the construction of a concrete building much faster than you might a steel building because you don't have to you don't have to order the sections and have them delivered from a far away location. Uh, let's see what else does have going for it. Well, the material is suitable for both architecture and structure. The material is suitable for both architecture and structure. And structure. Now, um, yes, many modern, some some more modern buildings do actually expose the steel elements or the other structural elements if they want sort of a, you know, an open kind of feel to the building. Uh, that's that's not uncommon in some more modernist buildings. But even then, uh, the difference between architecture and structure in this case, even yes, you can have say a open. You can have a, you know, some buildings a traditional way of building something. You'll have a drop ceiling or a drywall or plaster. Uh, covering up your structural steel elements. Now, some more modern buildings do actually expose those to the uh, to, uh, to the interior spaces for architectural reasons, and that can be nice. But uh, you're not going to ever really use uh, you're not going to use steel as you know, say, an exterior cladding. You're not going to have you know just thick steel plate as your outermost surface, you know, for your outer walls. But you can do that for concrete. You can have concrete as a uh, one advantage of concrete is you can actually have your outer cladding, your outer uh, building uh, facade material, actually be load-bearing as well. You can't really do that with a steel building uh, because you're not going to be welding together huge load-bearing plates uh, for your uh, exterior cladding. You're going to be using concrete or brick or, uh, some, or glass or some material like that. Uh, other things it has going for it, uh, it's going to be very fire resistant. Very fire resistant. So uh, pound for pound, or strength for strength, because of its larger or more enormous or bulky cross sections, uh, concrete ha uh, concrete members are obviously going to be much stouter than steel <laughs> members. So uh, the downside of that is they're going to take up more space, but the upside of that is they're going to take up more space. So uh, and but when something takes more space, intrinsically it's going to have a uh, it's going to be more fire resistant. 
Um, so anyway, it's going to intrinsically be more fire resistant, and uh, that's going to mean it's because of its uh, larger uh, volume to surface area ratio. Uh, and concrete buildings, because of this as well, because every member tends to have a much larger uh, uh, slenderness or much lower slenderness ratio, say like KL, KL over R, that kind of thing, it's going to be much more rigid. Concrete buildings tend to be much less flexible than steel buildings. So rigidity, if, if rigidity is beneficial, then the concrete buildings can be much more beneficial. So now if you're dealing with something like seismic design, rigidity is probably not what you want, but especially for things like a hurricane or wind or something like that. If, if you were going to if you were going to tell me that I had to design a building for an earthquake, well, I'm going to probably want a building that can flex and uh, bend a bit and dispel and, you know, a damp and energy vibration, etc. But if you're going to tell me I'm going to have a building that's going to need to survive a very strong hurricane, I don't, want, I don't care how flexible it is. I don't care how heavy it is. I just want a big, heavy, rigid building. So concrete buildings are really great for a hurricane or tornado design. Uh, low maintenance is a good one. Low maintenance, potentially. Uh, low maintenance and, of course, material availability. And that kind of goes with the economy uh, and locality stuff we discussed earlier. So let's discuss the, uh, the downsides of concrete. Why not concrete? What's, the, what's wrong with concrete? So why not? Why not just what I previously said? It sounds like uh, we should just make everything out of concrete. Well, yeah, the answer is yes, they do make everything out of concrete, but uh, so why not? Low tensile strength, for one. Now, we of course have ways of dealing with that, and, but uh, as we're going to see shortly, um, when the, the, con the tensile strength of concrete is so low, we're actually going to assume it's zero when designing with it. So that's, that is a downside of it. Um, how do we actually make concrete? How do we pour concrete? What do we need to, pour, what do we need to create first? Well, yes, we need to create cement. That's true, but oh, the formwork. Yes, the formwork. We need forms and shoring. So, depending on your labor costs, this can be very uh, this can be very cross prohibitive. Um, forms and shoring. So, um, if you do not have access to this, or if your local labor supply is very high, uh, this may be uh, this may be uh, a barrier. Uh, then also, it has low strength per unit weight or volume. Yes, concrete is stronger than, you know, in, in terms of a, if I lock a person in a concrete box, they're not going to be able to work, get, get out of there. But uh, what a lovely example. Um, but um, <laughs> but uh, uh, I know. Um, yes, uh, lo low strength per, uh, yeah, so, uh, yes, it is stronger compared to, say, uh, you know, human strength. But it compared to most of our materials we use, and maybe maybe stronger than wood in certain cases, but at least compared to a lot of other civil materials such as steel, it does have low strength uh, per unit weight or volume. Uh, unit weight or volume. So this is why we don't make airplanes out of concrete, for example. And not, well, we don't make uh, airplanes out of steel much any, well, either. But uh, sometimes you sometimes you sometimes see small amounts of steel in airplanes, but. Even then, not much. Um, but you'll never see a concrete airplane. That would be actually that would be impressive. Um, but anyway, uh, so anyway, low strength per weight or per unit weight or volume. Um, and so, uh, for example, um, the strength. Uh, to give you a feel for this, the strength is approximately um, per cross-sectional area is approximately five to ten percent that of steel. Five to ten percent that of steel. But the weight per volume weight per volume, or the density, I should say, um, while density is approximately 30 percent. Uh, while density is approximately 30 percent of steel. Oh, I'll give you some numbers on here. So for example, um, I tend to think of concrete, let me list some values here, concrete and steel. And I'll give some very low basic values of this, sort of the minimums um, for both of these. But um, uh, I'll give some very basic minimums for each of these. But obviously, you can make concrete with higher strengths and steel with higher strengths. And this, this is just a general relative comparison. So if I compare the yield strength here, the yield strength of each of these. Now, we don't use Fy for concrete. We use F prime C, but just for what we've used previously. Um, for concrete, a, can anyone give me a low value for the yield strength of concrete? Anyone know that? 3, yeah, 3,000 KSI is kind of a low value. Yes. 
Uh, PSI, oh yeah, well, 3,000 PSI, that would be a bit high, yes, thank you. Uh, 3,000 PSI, thank you. And uh, steel would be, uh, for A36, which is about as low as we're going to use, would be 36 KSI or, uh, you know, or three, uh, 36,000 PSI, pounds per square inch. So even on the bog standard, uh, you know, lowest kind of strength you'll ever be using, uh, the yield strength of the basic, you know, lowest grade concrete we'll use in structural applications is about 10 per is less than 10 percent the sort of the lowest grade steel we'll use in structural applications. But then let's compare the density, or I guess in this case the the gamma, the specific weight. Uh, a value for the specific weight of concrete. Now this can vary immensely depending on how you mix it up. There's much greater variation on uh, the con than concrete's density than steel's density. But a value, if if I don't know anything else, of the value I personally always assume for concrete, if I don't know anything else, is 150 pounds per cubic foot. And usually I say this includes uh, the steel reinforcing. But uh, you obviously can have heavier concrete, you can have lighter concrete, but sort of that bog standard uh, 30, uh, three, you know, 3 KSI concrete, I tend to think 150 pounds per cubic, pounds per cubic foot. And your, uh, you know, uh, standard uh, steel is going to be 150 pounds per cubic foot as well. Or sorry, not 150, 490 pounds per cubic foot uh, there. Okay, so we see here the difference. Yes, a steel is three times the density of concrete, but, so it's three times the density, um, so 3x gamma, three times the gamma, but for that 3x the gamma, you get 10x the strength, at least in terms of yield strength, more than 10x the strength. So we can see here that per unit weight, concrete or steel is going to be much, much uh, more effective uh, per uh, in terms of a strength per unit weight than concrete is going to be. Now, um, so, but then so um, again though the nice the, the thing that concrete has going for it though is even based on this even for uh, even uh, even though con uh, steel is going to be stronger per unit weight than concrete is. Uh, even based upon that, uh, concrete is just so enormously, uh, so much uh, cheaper. The, the low, it's just so uh, enormously cheaper that uh, often concrete is going to be a cheaper per you know per uh, uh, strength per dollar. It's going to have a superior strength per dollar value than steel will. But depending on your application. Uh, however, though, we can see here that if you have any kind of application where weight is absolutely critical, well, concrete is definitely not going to be your material of choice. Uh, and other, there's also one other big downside, force concrete, and that's going to be a material property, and it's going to, we're going to have time-dependent volume changes. Uh, time-dependent volume changes. And essentially what I mean by this is shrinkage and creep. Uh, shrinkage and creep. Uh, shrinkage, of course, is what happens when you immediately pour your concrete, and while it's curing and hardening, it shrinks, and in cases, in some cases, can crack. And often, we'll need to add. Uh, even if we find we don't need much reinforcing steel for strength, we will still need to add. Uh, we'll still need to add uh, um, some small amount of steel just to control for shrinkage and cracking. Uh, then for um, then for, uh, let's say, for, um, uh, for uh, creep, that is a more long-term effect where uh, you tend to have some degree of load shedding as the concrete ages. Okay, so next I'd like to look at concrete in compression. I'd like to uh, analyze it from a, uh, a strength point of view. Okay, so let's look at concrete in compression. So I'm, I want to look at a stress-strain diagram for concrete. Now, um, I want to first, uh, for comparison here, let's see, concrete in compression. Now, because it's a composite material, obviously concrete is made of many different elements. Uh, but in general, the main ingredients of concrete, of course, are going to be your uh, water, uh, your cement, uh, and then, of course, your fine aggregate and coarse aggregate. Now. Uh, the actual uh, the actual elements or the actual minerals that go into the uh, now the, the actual design of those things can get very complex. There are many different types of cement. There are many different types of other cementitious materials we can add, such as fly ash or silica fume. Uh, there are other uh, uh, there are other uh, admixtures we can add, uh, and there are many different types of aggregate we can use as well. 
But uh, so because of that, the stress strain diagram for concrete tends to be more complex than um, what we have for um, uh, for what we ha uh, have for uh, um, steel. Uh, but anyway, we can still simple draw out sort of a we can still draw out sort of a simplified um, version of this. Okay, so um, here. Um, let me la label a stress strain diagram. I'll put strain on the x-axis, x-axis, so that I can manage to talk, and uh, sigma, um, our stress on the y-axis, just like we always do. And then I'm going to draw sort of a generic curve. And this one isn't going to necessarily behave and have a nice clean. Uh, steel really does have that nice, uh, you know, pure linear zone and then pure elastic zone, and then a nice, uh, you know, um, sh uh, yield plateau, that kind of thing. Everything you've learned previously where you have a, a nice linear uh, elastic zone and then a nice horizontal, uh, uh, a nice horizontal uh, yielding zone, that is very much a, even that's a, simplifi a simplified case, but the materials that get closer to that are uh, simple metals like steel, aluminum, etc. When you get to a more complex or composite material like concrete, that relationship really starts breaking down. So we have to make certain, um, we will make certain conservative assumptions that allow us to design with it, but instead of getting this kind of behavior here, like you might with steel, we get more of a sort of smooth curve, more like this, just sort of a smooth curve with, so where exactly the yield uh, range is, well, we'll see. So I'm going to label just four sort of generic points on here and then describe uh, in detail what each of those entail. So this is sort of a qualitative thing here, a qualitative diagram, and I'm going to discuss the sort of four uh, zones or four uh, states that concrete will undergo as you increase the amount of compressive load applied to it. So I'll, I'm just going to label these one, two here, two probably uh, within the, um, uh, toward the end of the elastic, then we have three, and four. But again, it, it's not necessarily going to have a pure elastic zone. But uh, so let me give you some more notes on this before we looking at, start looking at these in detail. So again, concrete is made of a uh, brittle materials, but not elastic. So concrete made of brittle materials. Uh, it's made of brittle materials. It is made of brittle materials, but it does actually exhibit some ductility. Um, but it does exhibit some uh, some um, ductility. So how can you get glass to be ductile? Have you ever thought about that? Probably not. You could, yes, you could put glass. You could use glass fibers, I suppose. But the same idea. It's actually that's kind of the same idea as concrete. See. Um, yes, a, even though concrete is made of entirely brittle materials, not, none of the individual materials, so if you extract, it, this is kind of an interesting thing, if you uh, look at any of the individual materials in concrete, if you have a single crystal of a certain type of mineral that's in, say you have a, say you have limestone aggregate, if I take a single crystal of that limestone material and measure it, I will find it has very low ductility. If I look at a single crystal of, uh, of uh, cured cement, I will find that it has very low ductility. And the same thing for all of the individual compounds that are in, that are in uh, concrete. But this is kind of the weird thing about composite materials. Um, your concrete, if you look at it, a sample of concrete is going to have greater ductility than any of the individual compounds that go into it. How is that possible? How is that? Po yes, it's, it comes down to the bonding. It comes down to that th these things. This is not a single crystal. This is not a single rigid object. So instead, we get some ductility due to micro cracking. So you actually can get some ductility uh, more than you would expect in concrete due to micro cracking. This micro cracking um, is, uh, you know, it's micro because it's on the microscopic scale. You get very, very, very small cracks that form at the boundaries between the various uh, pieces of aggregate and the hardened cement paste. And so that produces a small amount of ductility. So uh, concrete actually ends up having more ductility than any of the individual uh, compounds or elements that go into it. Now, it's even with that, it's not, it's never going to have anywhere near as much ductility as, say, steel would. But it actually does have. Uh, this is one of those cases where, sort of the, um, sort of the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And if I were to define microcracking, um, so my, let me define microcracking. I can actually list this out here. 
What is microcracking? Well, uh, so you get uh, internal cracks, um, internal cla uh, cracks, very small internal cracks. <coughs> Not cracks that are actually going to, uh, you know, cause the material to fail, but tiny little cracks, uh, one eighth inch to one half inch long, uh, one half inch long, along the grain boundaries, along, um, and you can have actually two of them. Uh, you can have uh, bond cracks. So I said, but I, so I said along grain boundaries, but really there are two cases that we could mention. You can have micro cracking along uh, bonds. So bond cracks that would be along the aggregate paste boundary. Uh, along the aggregate slash paste boundary. So where this hardened cement paste uh, meets up with the aggregate uh, boundary. Or uh, we can also have mortal, uh, mor not mortal, uh, mortar cracks. Uh, mortar cracks. And mortar cracks, uh, this would cross the mortar uh, between the aggregates. Uh, cross uh, mortar bonds between aggregates. So we're really getting into the theory of concrete as a material here. Okay, so on the next slide, I'm going to go. I'm going to go through and find um, and and label all the individual stages of uh, how we uh, uh, how a concrete behaves and cracks. So. Uh, Okay, so next we're gonna, so again, we have, uh, we have, we see that concrete does crack. Concrete is go always going to crack. Uh, cracking is a normal thing of concrete. This is not something that, sh that should be uh, unanticipated. Um, now, cracks, if they are too large or they're, you know, actually causing pieces to fall off, that kind of thing, obviously that's gonna be bad. But as we will see as we go through this course, uh, uh, concrete cracks. Concrete is always going to crack. If you, uh, you know, uh, sometimes people get worried if their foundation slab cracks slightly. Now, if it does, uh, crack too much, that can be bad. But uh, concrete is always going to crack. Don't um, uh, don't uh, get to, don't uh, think that you can prevent concrete from cracking. It's just how concrete works as a material. Concrete is always going to crack. Now, uh, because we only rely on now that may, that may seem bad. How can we? Uh, you might think, how can we use concrete if it's always going to crack? But if we uh, but remember, uh, we have said that uh, when we design a column, when you, when you, when we design say beams. We are only going to rely on it for compression. So think about a beam um, with a bunch of cracks in it. Imagine a beam with a bunch of cracks in it, and I'm relying on the steel to carry all of the tension, and I'm only relying on the concrete to carry compression. If you take two cracked surfaces and force them up against each other, they're still going to be able to carry a massive amount of load. And so I don't. So for concrete design, since ultimately all we're relying on the concrete for is compression anyway, and the steel is carrying all of the tension. Ultimately, it doesn't matter if concrete cracks because, again, um, you're just going to rely on it for compression anyway. If, if a if a member is cracked, uh, as long as it has small micro cracking, not major cracking that is, you know, exposing the steel to major, you know, uh, say sulfate or chloride intrusion, etc. Um, I don't really care if the concrete is cracked or not. We're not relying it for tension. I don't, you know, if you if you have two cracked members and there are two cracked pieces, of, if you have two pieces of concrete. Uh, they're still held together by the steel, and as long as they're able to butt up against each other and, and transfer load through bearing, that's going to be perfectly fine. Of course, uh, so all concrete cracks, that's not something that we can, that we, uh, can prevent. Uh, it's just part of the nature of how the material works. Now, of course, after the end of this course, you may may, uh, or midway through this course, you may, be feel, uh, you may feel that you're cracking as well, but uh, that's another matter. So I really had a long lead up to that bad joke. Okay, um, so let's look at the cracking stages, also known as the units in this course. All right, no, uh, let's look at the cracking stages in a unial axial compression test. Hmm? Oh. You're not label the graph? I'm not going to label the graph because we're just, uh, I I'm just going to go through one, two, three, four here. Because this is more of a qualitative uh, analysis than anything else. Uh, so cracking stages in a uniaxial compression. In uniaxial compression. The stages of cracking in uniaxial compression. All right, so um, let's see here. 
Now let's say at the beginning, so here we're at the state of zero loading. So the only way that would occur is, uh, again, shrinkage can cause cracking, but the only way we'd start with a zero load uh, present, or if we, if we assume zero load initially, we're just basically assuming uh, that shrinkage causes no load cracks. Where shrinkage can cause load cracking is if you have, say, a foundation slab where um, you know, it's, it's resisted by the friction against the ground, or if you have steel in there that's uh, resisting that, um, resisting that uh, shrinkage, and then you can get cracking there. Um, so, but, but in a simple uniaxial compression, this would be like a cylinder of concrete. There's not going to be anything really resisting that uh, shrinkage, so it will be able to uh, shrink without cracking. So shrinking ca shrinkage causes, uh, so for, a cases, uh, for the case of a uniaxial compression test, uh, shrinkage would cause um, no load cracks. But again, in real structural members, if anything is restricting the shrinkage of your beam, uh, you can actually get shrinkage cracking. Uh, then at uh, stage two, um, at 30 percent, at 30 to 40 percent of ultimate load, at 30, 40, 30 to 40 percent of ultimate load, uh, you get uh, bond cracks. Um, you get bond cracks of ultimate load. Uh, you get bond cracks. So you start getting cracks between the, uh, um, you get, you, you start getting cracks between the uh, mortar and the uh, aggregate, or this, the hardened cement paste and the aggregate. Um, and this is stable, this is not going to be a problem. Again, it's just micro cracking here. And uh, at this stage, about, at about 30%, at, at about 30 to 40 percent of the ultimate load, the uh, stress strain diagram uh, starts going, uh, it gradually curves from linear. Uh, curve uh, gradually curves from linear, or gradually li leaves linear zone. It gradually leaves linear zone. See, the problem with concrete, uh, or one of the problems with concrete, uh, as we've discussed, is that unlike steel, it does not have a very, very uh, well-defined endpoint of the linear of the linear range. So instead, what we have to do is we have to, um, as we'll see later in the code, we just have so, uh, as we see later when we and when we start looking at the ACI code, uh, we just have to make certain assumptions about what we assume the yield strength will be, um, and we have to we have basically have to pick some level of okay. Well, we know the curve is going to do this kind of uh, smooth curve uh, smooth curve behavior, but we're just going to pick some level that we define as this is uh, you know at at no point is it truly linear, but obviously right at zero it's incredibly linear. Far from zero, it's, it's definitely not linear, but we're just going to have to set some standard and say, okay, this is linear enough for the sake of considering elastic design. And we'll, we'll work with that. Okay, then stage three. Uh, stage three at 50 to 60 percent. At 50 to 60 percent, um, you get localized mortar cracks like we discussed previously. This is where the mortar starts to crack across, uh, across the uh, actual paste boundaries. Uh, localized mortar cracking, and it would crack uh, parallel to compression. You'll get cracks forming uh, parallel to the compressive forces. Um, um, let's say um, parallel to compression uh, here, and it will, and this is stable. And this is sometimes referred to as the discontinuity limit. Discontinuity limit. So when I say parallel to the compression, so again, this would be this kind of test would be performed in a uh, strength testing machine, a hydraulic uh, compression machine. So you'd have an end cap here, you'd have an end cap here, and you would be applying some enormous compressive load on this thing. So the way these things actually start to fail, if you've ever done one of these, and uh, those of you in uh, who've taken one of my, uh, who've taken my 34, 34 class, you'll remember this. How these things tend to fail is they form longitudinal cracks, because as this thing wants to fail, well, as thing we know from um, say uh, Poisson's ratio, that kind of thing, that as things, uh, if you're compressing something, uh, as long as the volume is going to be conserved, if it's in, if the, the actual volume can't decrease. If this thing is going to decrease in length in the longitudinal direction, it must also become wider. So it's going to become shorter in this dimension, but it has to become wider in this dimension. So that's why you start to get cracks forming in this direction. At this plane, the thing starts to pull apart uh, along those planes. Okay? 
And then um, you start, and then stage four. This is sort of the, uh, this is still b b before the ultimate stress, but this is at the point where things really become unstable. And at this point, uh, things are really starting to break down or really breaking down at this point. So that's 75 to 80% of ultimate, of ultimate, at 75 to 80% of ultimate, um, you get a continuous pattern of micro cracks. You get a continuous pattern of micro cracks. Of micro cracks. Um, and this is what we would refer to as the critical stress. Because beyond this, it may actually be able to support more load, but beyond this, it is unstable. Beyond this, it is unstable. It'll start breaking apart, it'll start shedding load, etc. Okay. Um, so also, and, and at this level, what's critical about this, you may, your concrete may be able to withstand short-term load in this, in this region. So if you were designing your building for ultimate load at this region, this would actually be, uh, you could actually design, uh, you can design your ultimate loading for things above this, for your actual ultimate stress. But what, what the key for this is, is that long-term loads above this level uh, will cause failure. Above this level will cause failure. So for example, um, your ultimate load case might be something like a, a seismic event where you're, where you're designing your building to withstand repeated uh, seismic waves pummeling it. Well, individual, in terms of an actual earthquake, individual seismic waves don't exhibit you know, constant long-term loading. The load, that high, the highest peak value of load occurs only a fraction of a second or one or two seconds, et cetera. Or during a hurricane, the maximum load a member may, uh, may uh, feel in terms of kips or kip feet, et cetera, would, might be during a very strong hurricane gust for, uh, for you know, here in Houston or something. And so, you know, the, so you might have a 150 mile per hour hurricane gust or a 200 mile hour hurricane gust or something like that, but that would be a short instantaneous load. Uh, and then, so the hurricane is not going to continuously blow at that maximum speed for hours and days on end. The hurricane may actually last that long, but the sustained winds are going to be much lower than the uh, gust winds. And so you would, maybe you would design, uh, you might design, uh, if you're designing a concrete building, you might design, uh, when you're designing for that gust, that, that, that peak gust, you might use your ultimate strength limit for that. But then for your sustained load, your, your sustained wind, you might limit yourself to an elastic stress for that. So uh, again, this is, you're, beyond this, you can have momentary instantaneous loads, but uh, you, can't, uh, you cannot uh, subject your members to long-term, and long-term meaning hours in this case, rather than you know, seconds or minutes. Um, so, also this level, uh, you'll get, uh, also at the stress level, you'll get concrete expansion, and the, so concrete will expand under load. Uh, again, as we discussed previously, a Poisson's ratio type of thing. Uh, concrete expands, and that causes pressure on reinforcement. Uh, pressure on reinforcement. And um, let's say, however, in beams, uh, the, the impact of the unstable region is reduced, though. And that's because they are more, they are able to more easily share uh, loads with other members uh, in region uh, with other, um, uh, let's see, in, in, in beams, impact of unstable region uh, is diminished as they are able to share a load with other members, but that's okay. Now I know this is very complicated and we can, the whole point of this is just to illustrate how complex concrete is as a material. It's not, uh, with steel, we saw that we just had to, we had an ultimate stress and a yield stress. And that was pretty much it. That's all we really had to worry about. Concrete, by its nature, is a much more complex material. It is a composite material. It's made of many different elements. Even the, even the mixed design of concrete is very involved. Uh, so, as a result of that, we have much more uh, complex things that we want that we'd have to consider. Okay. So, um, all right. I think that will do it for this portion of lecture. This is a nice breaking point uh, when we're looking at concrete as a material.